This is episode number 143 featuring English artist Haiti Joe Summers. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric, and due to the magic of technology, I'm coming to you from Europe. I spent the last week in France hosting the annual fine art connoisseur trip through the south of France, and then before that, hosting a painting trip for some of the members of that trip uh, in St. Paul de Vence. We had a great time. Now, I'm in Edinburgh, Edinburgh, Scotland, to check out the art here, and it's hard for me to understand people here, believe it or not, uh, but then again, you know, that's me. Um, going to do some paintings, check out the art here, finish up the art trip, and the fall color here right now is just beautiful. It's stunning, in fact. Within a couple of weeks of returning, I'll be going to the Figurative Art Convention and Expo in Williamsburg, Virginia. I hope to see you there. We're going to be doing a plein air paint out uh, at the opening day on the streets of historic Williamsburg for the people that come to the conference. And it's going to be a lot of fun. Gives a little plein air influence to that crowd. And of course, you get a little figurative art influence by going. Four days and four stages, some of the most amazing painters on earth teaching figure and portrait. One of the things that's going to be amazing is Nikolai Blohin coming in from Russia. Had to get a special visa to do it. Been trying to do this for two years. It's a one-time opportunity, lifetime opportunity to see a Russian master and one of the greatest Russian masters at work. This is a museum quality painting crowd. That means people who strive to be museum quality want to be in museums, and I'd love to see you there. So, one of the greats, Ives Gamble, said that every plein air painter needs to learn figure painting to improve their landscapes. He says it really matters, and I certainly do it. I do figure painting and portrait painting every single week, plus I like to do landscape painting. And both are fun for me. So learn more at figurativeartconvention.com, figurativeartconvention.com. And of course, the plein air convention is going to be in Denver in May, and you've got to do this. The seats aren't going to last till May. Based on the coming price increase in November, they probably won't even last that long. Last year's numbers have already been exceeded, and now we have Scott Christensen, Jill Carver, Kwang Ho, Daniel Sprick, and a host of incredible superstars uh, one time together in Denver, amazing scenery, national park, just doesn't get any better than this. You've got people coming in from all over the world for this one. You can learn more at plenairconvention.com. Coming up after the interview, I'll be answering art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. But first, you're going to meet a really cool lady, Hedy Jo Summers. Let's get right to that interview. Haiti Joe Summers, welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you very much. It's nice to speak to you. Nice to speak to you. We've not met, and I'm looking forward to this because I'm a fan of your work. Um, I've seen some of your video. I've seen your book, and uh, you're, you're quite popular on social media, so welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. How did uh, this this uh, interest in painting come about for you originally? Well, I was always um, drawing as a child, and I was always encouraged to draw by my parents. Um, so, you know, all I ever wanted for Christmas were, were chalks and paper and pencils. And so um, it was just seemed natural that I would go to art school after school finished. And is that what you did? Yes, yeah, I went to art college for a year's foundation course and the tutors there steered me towards illustration because I could draw um, and that suited me fine because um, in the fine art room it was all 
plaster of Paris and making things with, um, you know, chicken wire and it all looked, <laughs> it all looked really messy and daunting to me. So uh, after the year, I went to university and studied illustration for three years. And and uh, yeah. roughly what time what what year was that? Uh, so I graduated in 1994 All after right. four years of study. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious about the education system in England because uh, it's very difficult these days for an artist to find uh, the fine arts in an art program in college. Um, illustration, uh, life drawing almost doesn't exist in most schools. Some it does. And mm -hmm. to, to find these skills, one almost has to go to the atelier of, a, of an artist and study there, uh, which of course is what's been happening. So mm. is, is that not the case in the UK? You have a pretty solid uh, no, foundation? No, not really. We, even back then, I didn't even know of any ateliers. I mean, you know, there may have been one or two in London, but um, in every big city, there would be a polytechnic. Um, my university was a polytechnic when I started, and the, the, the degrees that students study there were the more practical degrees, so things like the arts, um, uh, illustration, design, interior design, all that kind of thing you could find in, um, in most polytechnics all, all around the country. Uh -huh. I am really glad I studied illustration looking back because uh, I had really had great tutors. We had a full-time course. We were in there Monday to Friday, 9 till 5. Um, they encouraged us to do lots of sketchbook projects. Uh, we had a whole day every week of life drawing. And outside of my, in my spare time, I used to go to an art society to join in with extra life drawing and portrait sessions. So I think it was a really great education where some people I've spoken to who have gone down the fine art route haven't had that kind of groundwork in drawing and working from the model particularly. So oh. I feel very lucky. That I, yeah, well, yeah. that's that's pretty essential if you're going to be doing that, I would think. So, um, you know, it, se it seems as though illustrators, people who trained as illustrators turn out to make really great painters. Um, and that's probably a little bit of an assumption, but... Um, Seem to work for you. I see. I also know lots of um, architects turned artists as well after they've retired, and they seem to make great painters too. Um, but yeah, I, I feel really fortunate, and I knew by the end of my degree course that I didn't actually want to be a, an illustrator, so I didn't pursue um, illustration work. Uh, I think I had this kind of stubborn streak, and I just wanted to make paintings. <laughs> and try to sell the painting rather than for my artwork to be illustrating what somebody else wanted to say. Right. You um, wanted to be your own yeah. voice. Yeah, I came to that conclusion. And I, I, I wrote that in my, degree, in my final um, degree piece. I don't actually want to be an, <laughs> an illustrator. Um, but it, yeah, it worked well and I passed my degree. So uh, I went from there quite straight afterwards to work in a picture framers, which actually you know, so that I felt connected to the arts. But um, it did give me useful skills working there for a few years. And after only a year or two, I was invited back to my university to teach one day a week to teach in the life drawing. So I got into teaching very quickly after graduating. And then uh, how did you pursue this as, as a career? You know, you worked in the gallery, you were around the arts, you were teaching. Uh, is that how you were making your living or did you get to the point where you're making your living selling art? Yeah, uh, so yeah but that's, it's, been, you know, it's been a really long journey. So uh, in the early years, um, yeah, I carried the, the picture frame in, the, the teaching. I set up local classes and started uh, doing more teaching, less picture framing, just teaching in the village, um, drawing and painting. And uh, then... There were a few years, and exhibiting as well. I, I, I always tried to have little exhibitions. And then there were a few years when my children were young and I didn't do very much career-wise. Um, and then when they were both at school, I started back with the teaching painting classes again, uh, ex exhibiting again. And um, then, oh, it's just, you know, we, we went to actually 
I took the family to live on a French island in 2011 for a year. And when we got back from there, things really started to take off for me career-wise with, with painting and selling paintings and, um, you know, prizes and that kind of thing. So you went to a French island for a year and was the intention mm-hmm. uh, just to have time with your family? Was the intention to draw and paint? What was that all about? Yeah, so, well, my husband really needed a break from um, a high-pressured job. It was very stressful, and we lo- we loved this little French island, and we'd been curious about what it would be like to see it all year round and not just in August um, on holiday. Uh, and we just, you know, he'd just come to a, a, a moment where he needed a real break with his work, and we thought, well, the children are still kind of young enough let's have an adventure, let's just do what we can to have a year living in this place. So we had a a crazy kind of six months organising everything, uh, selling everything that we could to to buy a little house over there. And um, we moved in, I think we moved in on, uh, we travelled on Boxing Day um, and then we came back on, on Boxing Day the following year. So the children went to school and uh, it was really it was really a big year for me because I was away from the regular weekly commitment. And so I was able to just paint whatever I wanted and no teaching. And that's when I really got into plein air painting that year, actually. Yeah. I, and I want to probe that for just a second, but I want to, I want to go backwards for, for a moment. You said mm-hmm. that um, it took you away from your weekly commitments and uh, that's when you really started taking off as a painter is it your opinion that that artists tend to get um, waylaid or delayed uh, from from doing what they should be doing because they're doing the things that they have to be doing to survive? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. I think that it's, I mean, not just artists, but I think we all get into um, patterns, don't we, very, very easily. And... Uh, a way of working and you know that feeling when you're on holiday even if it's just for a few days even if it's just a few days at Christmas um, and you're relaxing and you're not working and somehow you're just able to see things more clearly do you, do you know what I mean you're able to just having a little space between you and your weekly routine sure you start to re- you start to imagine all kinds of things might be possible you know your your, your mind kind of runs away with you and uh, for me that year was that complete chance to think well uh, when I go back to England because we always knew we would go back and when I go back how would I like how would I like my working week to be you know do I want to teach weekly classes uh, or do I want to teach workshops um, day workshops which frees me up to plan them in when I want them to be you know rather than having this every three days a week um, place that I have to be and people that I have to teach so it was just a great opportunity to to see a different way forward for me and so how did everything change when you came back well so the other thing is I was a little bit isolated living on this tiny island and not speaking French very well at all and um, I didn't have anything very much to do with other artists or um, anything there was a little summer exhibition but um Towards the end of the year, I, I, I became really very aware of the possibilities that we have when, when I'm back in the UK, all the, the exhibitions that we can enter, the competition. Um, if, if it's an art scene that I knew about and I didn't really know what was happening in France. Uh, and I just was determined when I came back that I would grab opportunities really and, and be living in this tiny little space I mean the island was there were long paths there and it was kind of two miles it's about two miles by a mile and a half so it's very very small uh, and it just seems as though coming back to England just seems as though the world opened up you know I suddenly um, you know suddenly London didn't seem so far away and, you know, uh, I just threw myself into uh, uh, planning for competitions um Within six months of coming back in 2012, I'd won a major competition that I, I only had to enter online. So I'd entered 
work and I'd won this title of Artist of the Year, which from, from a big art society in the UK, which was a major deal um, and just a huge confidence boost as well um, and, and a nice big prize. So, uh, yeah, so, so all kinds of opportunities just started to open up to me. But uh, they were always there, but I maybe hadn't been as focused before I'd had this year break. Um, suddenly I could see more clearly where, what, I, what I needed to do. Well, sometimes that's why professors do sabbaticals, uh, so they can see clearly for the future. Uh, mm. What uh, you, said, you said you started plein air painting about that time when you got back. Tell me about when you, wh- wh- how you discovered plein air painting and uh, why you decided to do that. So I was just um, free of any schedules and on this really, really pretty little island and I just started to, I mean, I could walk to a beach uh, within five minutes of my house when I'm, when I'm there and uh, I think not having a car as well was fantastic because you actually waste so much time when your car's outside. If you decide you need to buy something, you just hop out, hop into the car, drive off and you actually can waste so much time that way. But I was literally tied to the house on the island, and I only left the island once a week to go shopping. Uh, so um, I did just sit, it just made sense to get outside and paint the lovely um, scenes around, around me. Uh, I didn't know plein air painting was what it was called, called particularly. I didn't know it was a big thing. Um, but because I was quite lonely, it was, it was during the, towards the end of the year that I finally begrudgingly joined Facebook. Um, I just don't know why I was so against it before, but I I joined Facebook and I discovered that there were people doing this all over the world, um, all over the place. Yeah, it was really nice. So you came back, you've been plein air painting. Uh, What happened with your career from that point? Uh, So I won that that competition and um, then I was invited a few months later to by the BBC to paint to paint at the Queen's Diamond Jubilee River pageant um, in London, which was um, I was very much looking forward to. And there were about I think there were about a dozen artists invited, and we were painted to paint on the Millennium Bridge, and we were to paint this procession of boats as it happened in front of us. <laughs> and the weather on the day was absolutely dire. I mean, it was June. And it was raining and it was blowing a gale and it was really horrendous. It was really quite um, storm-like conditions. Uh, but the, that thing was seen, um, it was televised and it was seen all around the world. So suddenly I was having comments from people in Australia and uh, all, all over the place. And it was, um, it just felt as though the world was opening up to as I was connecting to people from America and from across England and, uh, just yeah, just making the world a smaller place, really. And then also, I was determined to. I'd always wanted, ever since I was a student, to become a member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, which was very difficult to achieve. But during that year, when my mind was, you know, focused, I came back really focused, and I wasn't going to miss an opportunity to enter work ever again. And um, so you have to have work accepted as a non-member into the annual exhibition at least three years in a row, at least, um, uh, before they'll consider you for membership. Uh, so three, I think three years ago, came back. I was elected an associate member, and then the following year I was elected a full member. So, uh, yeah, lo- lots of things happened. So what is the significance of that from the perspective of those of us um, it, we, those of us here don't necessarily know the status of that, what that does for one's career. Tell us a little bit about the Royal Institute. Yeah, so here, here in the UK, there are um, there's an umbrella association called the Federation of British Artists. There are nine member societies, um, including the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, the Royal Institute of Painters in Watercolor, um, the Pastoral Society, etc. Um, so it's like an umbrella body with these nine societies. They're very historic societies. I mean, the the ROI was, which is what we call the the Royal Institute of Oil Painters. The ROI was founded in 1882, 
um, people like um, Sergeant Laura Knight, um, Walter Sickert used to exhibit um, in, in the earlier days. Uh, and so we have this wonderful link to recent history and some of our, you know, some of our greatest artists, which is wonderful. Um, the, the society's exhibit at the Mao Galleries, which is the most fantastic space in central London, it's situated between Trafalgar Square and Buckingham Palace, and it's really like um, it's really like the home of figurative painting in the UK. Yeah, that's the way I see it. Anyway, <laughs> it's like a home from home. Uh, all the societies have an annual exhibition there, so the annual exhibition is to show members' work, and it's also for open submissions um, for anybody to enter work. And the hope is that through the open submission, we'll be finding new members. Um, but it's it's really super special. It's very difficult to become a member of these things. And there are only um, about 65 members at any one time. So some of our very best painters like David Curtis and Trevor Chamberlain and, and Ken Howard are members of the ROI. So it's a, it's a real honor and a privilege to be uh, a member with them. Sounds like it. And, and are you, do you have to keep keep up something to be able to retain membership once you're brought in or is you're in as long as you want to be in? Yes, the expectation is really once you're in, you're, you're in for life, um, which is fantastic, unless you do something, <laughs> unless you do something very badly. But yeah, so you, you know, you, you have to keep um, putting, showing your work in the, in the exhibition every year. That's really the only requirement. But I like to play um, more of a role in the society than that because the society is run by the members. So I've joined the council and I organise um, events for friends of the ROI and I help with the social media and, and that kind of thing because I think that um, being a member um, is not just, you know, it's not just for your own, what's the word? Uh, it's not just like an esteem thing because you get to have the initials after your name and probably doesn't mean anything to you in the USA, but um, a full member of the Royal Institute of Oil Painters has the, has the ROI um, after their name, which galleries and collectors in the UK understand uh, what it means. Um, it's not, but it's, it's really important that you give back to the society, I think, so... You don't just become a member for your own glory, but you then have to play a part. That's the way I see anyway. I think that's exactly right. It's something that we all need to be taking a lesson from because when we're parts of organizations, whether it's, you know, here it might be Oil Painters of America or American Impressionist Society or Pastel Society, et cetera, I think that it's very important that we, we play a role, that we contribute our time uh, so that these, yeah. because these organizations don't operate without volunteer work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they they don't. And um, yeah, and also I've been helped and encouraged, you know, by by lots of. I've been helped and encouraged by some fantastic um, artists who are established, and I and now I feel I'm in a position where I can um, help and encourage other others who are up and coming. And that's a good feeling to give back. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Definitely. So. Um, I, I'm curious about the plein air movement um, throughout the rest of the world, um, and, and especially mm. in the UK. You know, we've seen a, uh, a a just explosion in the US in terms of the movement. You know, when I started the magazine 15 years ago, there, you know, there were maybe two or three plein air shows, and there were just no workshops to speak of. There just wasn't a lot going on. Yeah. Since that time, it's just blossomed, and it is, you know, we have a couple hundred, maybe 300 shows around the country. We have, you know, just lots and lots of things going on, and we, of course, have a, a massive number of people who are painting. Uh, yeah, what's incredible. happening in the UK? Well, I think we, we're slower, but we're, um, we're catching up, up with that, too, because we uh, probably tend... 10, 15 years ago here, it just wasn't spoken of as a term, plein air. There weren't any plein air events at all. And we we don't have anything like as many as you do. But in the last um, six, seven years, they've started um, competitions. They're all 
competitions and events, and they're all run differently, but they're dotted around um, the country. We don't have anything on a grand scale like 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 your you know your convention and your magazine. We don't have anything like that. But um, uh, some of us actually are getting together, and we had a uh, a group of friends got together, and we decided to have a a plein air exhibition in London because we we exhibit together with things like the Royal Institute of Oil Painters, but there isn't a society for plein air painting here um, that that just doesn't exist but it's it, the term plein air and uh, it's not quite new but it's really really taking off here so we we organized um a couple of london paint outs uh there were 27 of us exhibiting together but we invited anybody to come and join us for a day painting and the response was incredible we had really probably 200 artists turn up and some had come from Scotland. Uh, some had come from somebody had come from the Scilly Isles, uh, the Isle of Wight. Um, people really travelled, and we realised there is a huge appetite for there are many, many, many plein air painters now in the UK, and there's a huge appetite for getting together and um, painting together. Well, we have actually we have uh, you know lots of subscribers in the UK. A lot of people get the magazine over there, and and. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, um, well, we would love to collaborate and make sure that um, the British and the and all of all of Europe is co- is collaborating with the U.S. and that we're doing some things together. I'm sure painters from Ooh, here, definitely. painters from here, would love to come over there and vice versa. We'd love to have your folks at the conventions, et cetera. And mm-hmm. uh, because I think that we have this, you know, part of this community is the responsibility of helping it grow, helping other people embrace it, getting a sense of um, you, you know, building it everywhere. I was talking to someone earlier today who's younger and who's who's dealing with a lot of younger plein air painters and getting them more involved in the community is really critical. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it's wonderful. I heard you talking to the um, English guys a few weeks ago um, on the podcast. There, they have a wonderful event there in Southern Ireland, uh, yes. in Wexford. Well, uh, and, and, I, and oh, go ahead. Oh, I did come to the Plan Air Convention quite a few years ago in Monterey, maybe about six years ago now, um, and it was unbelievable, just incredible. Uh, English, you know, any English um, or, or British painter who makes the effort to travel over to one of your events I wouldn't regret it. But I was on high. I was on a high for weeks afterwards, um, <laughs> and I'm coming. I'm coming again to Denver, Colorado, and I'm very excited. Yeah, we're we're excited mm-hmm. to have you there, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful. You know, of course, it's changed so much in six years. It's just so much, sure? so much different. So much. You know, we have this year uh, for the first time. We we have a, a track for event organizers. So people mm-hmm. in the UK who are organizing events or want to, or people in America, we're putting together a best practices track so that during the time when the rest of the painters are out painting, because we go painting every day, uh, the event organizers, who oftentimes are people who work with cities or, or um, organizations, charities, et cetera, they'll be together mm-hmm. and they'll be sharing best practices, you know, what works best, what what helps the artist best, what helps sales best, et cetera. So that's, uh, that's going to be fun. And then this year for the first time, you know, we've always had an oil color, uh, watercolor pastel track. And then we've had an extra stage, which kind of absorbs a lot of different things. Well, this year we're also adding an acrylic track because acrylic is certainly Mm. becoming much more of the plein air scene than it ever has been, especially because of some of the new acrylics that are not necessarily fast drying and so on so that people yeah. you know can see them paint more like oil paint so it's it's changed a lot it's wonderful you got you have to keep evolving don't you whether you're whether you're a single person or or you're a whole um organization you have to keep keep evolving absolutely that's that's absolutely right well yeah, let's I'm very excited yeah i remember last time that i you know you know, people talk about filling up their sort of creative well. I just, I was just came back so inspired. It was wonderful. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. So, um, tell me a little bit about uh, your book. Um, I, I have it actually. I have it right here. But 
Uh, <laughs> explain it to everybody else so that they understand a little bit about it. You you kindly sent me a copy. Oh yeah, thanks. So uh, I was asked a few years ago by um, an, art, an art and craft book publisher in the UK to write a book about oil painting, um, and it was a great experience actually because they they really gave me free reign as to what I wanted to write about, what I wanted the book to be like. So um, it kind of serves as an introduction to oil painting for people who have never ever be, begun. But also, I think it offers lots of general painting and seeing advice for people who don't even work in oils. You know, they work in other mediums and hopefully um, encourages a more uh, intermediate or advanced painters as well to find their own uh, voice and give them ideas for, for further work. Um, yeah, so it's just a bit of a... It just touches on lots of topics like composition and values and using different color palettes, um, working from photos, that kind of. And the book is different. the book is called Vibrant Oils, right? Yes, it is. Now, um, Haiti, what would you say is your superpower? If you had to pick one or two things as a painter that maybe are really important to you, or things that you, maybe you do a little bit differently, what would you say that superpower is? <laughs> that was really funny. Um, so I suppose I could boil down what I do to, um, I suppose I, I can find, I, 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 I can find beauty in, in ordinary scenes. I think um, I can find magic wherever I am uh, because I'm inspired by the way light reveals a subject. So I, I can, you know, people often say, I never would have seen that as a painting subject. I, lo I love it when people say that because it means that I've shown them something um, something new. So I like finding beauty in ordinary scenes and I want to, I want to express myself in an economical um, and personal way. I just try to... Uh, say what I want to say succinctly with the minimum of fuss really I, I just I just want to be direct and uh, and get my message across. One thing that I, I would have said your superpower would be is your brushwork. Thank you. Talk brushwork is very important. Talk important about to me, yeah. talk about brushwork and, and what what you do. Well so I when I was young, uh, still a student, probably, I read a quote by an artist in a magazine, and I had no idea who said it at all. But he said, um, say what you want to say in the painting, then get out. There is no use chattering on after you have made your point. <laughs> um, and that, it just stuck with me. I could never get that out of my head once I'd read it. It's, it's been guiding me for the, for the last... Um, kind of 25, 30 years. Uh, I, I, my brush marks are very direct because I am always trying to um, say the important things that need saying in the painting and then leave it be. So I very much want to see evidence of uh, brush marks in my work and I... I love the abstract um, properties of painting. I like, I'm like. i excited by, you know, having my face up close to the painting surface and looking at this crazy, crazy arrangement of marks. Um, I'm not interested in a kind of a polished finish. I really want to, I want to look close, see abstract shapes, and then move away and let the image form together. I, I just also think that bookmarks are you know, your own personal handwriting. So you really want to you want to show them. You don't want to blend them and polish them off and make them disappear. I think that the whole charm of the painting is in your own marks that you make that nobody else makes. I mean, nobody else has the same handwriting as you. So why should anybody else put their paint on in the same way? Deborah Hughes says that lay the paint down and leave it alone. Yeah, 
that's right. I think if you're thinking about what you're doing and you plan that mark, then you can put the mark down and leave it alone, can't you? I think um, lots of the fussing comes in just, uh, I suppose, just uncertainty. And one thing that plein air painting is terrific for developing um, is that it, it, it forces you to be more decisive because you've got so many things stacked against you. Uh, you haven't got very much time before the whole scene is changing. So it forces you to make decisions, and that's a, a good thing for your brush marks. Yeah. So are you making um, um, informed studies, or are you selling your studies as completed works, uh, or using them to, to build studio works? What what is Are you painting small? What What is your purpose when you're outdoors? Yeah, most of my paintings are quite small um, outdoors, so anything between eight by 10 and sort of 16 by 16 is an average size for me to work outdoors. And I do sell um, most of my plein air paintings. I've, I've finished work and I um, I often work in one session as well. So lots of the work I sell has just been painted in one session, plein air. Um, but now I have this fantastic studio which we've been developing and I... I had a solo exhibition in London last year um, and because when you're hanging sort of 70 or 80 paintings all together, you don't want them all to look the same size and I was aware that I needed to produce some larger work. Um, so the larger work was all done in my studio but some of it from life you know, paintings of my studio and some um, were based on smaller plein air pieces. And I was really surprised that the the big ones you know they're obviously more expensive too <laughs> and uh, I was really surprised and delighted that the big ones sold and they sold really quickly so I didn't know I didn't really realize that there was a market for, for me to make bigger work um I, I just uh, I suppose I just love the little piece the little pieces so much and they're so um intimate the small paintings but um, yeah, but now I have this huge space, and so I, I'm keen to, really, I'd like to, to going forward, I'd like to take advantage of the summer months and work outside from kind of April to October, November, um, and then have, go revisit those places in the studio and work on some larger pieces from some of the places I've been to throughout the year. Now, I understand this new studio is pretty lovely. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, it's <laughs> smashing. Um, yeah, it was, um, It was. we moved house three years ago and we're in Lincolnshire, so we're just surrounded by fields um, we're in the middle of, uh, we're at the edge of a very, very, very tiny village um, next to fields and it's very peaceful here. Yeah. Um, the studio was a, if you imagine, quite an ugly, big, ugly concrete workshop that was built in the 1970s. It was built by the chap who lived here. He was a joiner, uh, and his son was a joiner too, so they used to work in this um, workshop in the garden. It wasn't heated or anything, and um, it's quite a good size. And when we bought the house, we, you know, we could see the potential for developing it into a a studio, the best studio I've ever had, and it's, it's amazing. So we're, we're, it's still ongoing, but we've spent two years so far um, extending it and insulating it and lighting it and heating it. And we've got two little stone stables, which were just nearby. So we've built a link in between. We've knocked a wall through to those um, so that we, we now have a little um, sort of porch or lobby area that you come into and then on one side is my studio which is now it's about 40 feet 45 feet long by 20 feet wide it's pretty big um, and on the other side of the lobby there is going to be um, a kitchen and bathroom and then next to that my husband has an office now so it's we're, we're self-contained out here away from the house we can just lock the house and to come and work out here and uh, now have a space that I can, you know, invite people to, which is really lovely. Oh, sounds great. Where can we see some photos of it? Ooh, uh, I sometimes put them on my, I put some on my Instagram stories. 
a few photos on there. Okay, and what's your highlights. what's your handle on Instagram? Uh, it's just Heidi J Summers. It's just my name. Just your name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's such so, a long name. And no, there's not much room to do anything else. But, uh, yeah, I do love my studio. I'm just starting to get... I've been here this week. We've just got back from three weeks in France. And I've been here this week and I've discovered something. But it's already... It's such an inviting space that people have been coming in each day. I've had a few visitors this week and then they they stay. They stay for kind of a couple of hours because it's so nice. <laughs> so nice here. You know, so I'm going to have to be careful about telling people when I'm home and when I'm not home, do you know what I mean? I'm not going to get any work done. I'm not going to have any work done like this. You know. So, um, yeah, I will have, I will have, I'm really, really looking forward to when it's, when the kitchen's finished. I'm really looking forward to having um, uh, an exhibition here and a couple of workshops here as well. Yeah. Sounds magical. So when you're, yeah. uh, what's your process when you're, when you're doing painting outdoors? Um, are you starting out with thick paint and laying down brush strokes from the beginning, or will you put a wash in first to kind of get the overall shapes and then and then lay down your brush work? Um, yeah, it's well, it varies um, uh, depending on my subject and from you know what I'm doing lately. Uh, but I don't I don't like to stay with any one mode for too long, but generally speaking, I've already tinted the boards before I leave the studio so they'll have a kind of a neutral a warm, a sort of a warm a light grey on them um, and then when I'm when I'm out on site I used to very much use a small brush to start with and something like raw umber um, uh, and just sketching the main lines I'm moving away from that now because it's kind of like a even the lines is kind of like a security blanket for me and I feel like it's something I don't need to be doing and shouldn't be doing so I'm more likely these days to start with um, a bigger brush and loose large larger areas of of color and value straight away rather than having this sort of um, linear guide first <laughs> and then uh, I try to get straight to the values and colors now and, and just um you're more likely to move paint around that way you know and not try to keep within the guidelines that you started off with so what do you think are the most important principles that you eventually learned after you'd been painting for a long time that you had an aha moment and said this is what i need to do differently because we hear from a lot of people who are how do I get myself to the next level? You know, I feel stuck. What did you do, or what do you recommend? Well, the way, the way I see my own journey is, um, as I say, I was very much into drawing as a child, uh, and I was very interested in shape. I still am. But I think... Um, in, in recent years, I've been wanting my work to look more impressionist, more painterly. And, and um, I, CW Monday did a uh, a pre a, a, sem, a workshop um, when I came to the Plein Air Convention, and he said something that I remember. He said, "Oh, oh you know, a painting with with all its edges so sharp, you could you could shave yourself with it or something." <laughs> it's, really really made me laugh because that is how my work used to be certainly you know 10 years ago and even um uh, uh, i think that i made a discovery that um drawing is really related to shape and painting is really related to suggestion and so now i think of painting as having to have both i think of a painting as having to have drawing and a looseness you know it has it has to have a balance of both and so i um i think that in recent years just uh poetry and and feeling are becoming more important to me than description so i i guess it's not it's a natural process that we might go through when we start to paint we want to copy what we're seeing and we we you know we feel pleased 
with ourselves, if we can get a lightness to what we're seeing. And then as we develop as painters, we just want more, don't we? We just <laughs> don't really, we just want more. So I just, um, I just want that. I want those soft edges now. I don't want everything to be about drawing and line. Um, I want really loose passages, um, quite mysterious and suggestive passages alongside, you know, real focus, you know, strong shape. So if I were to attend one of your workshops, uh, what's that process going to be like? What, what, if I'm a new painter, what am I going to go through? Well, for, when I'm teaching, I, I really I try to get people to see in terms of shapes, values, and colors, and and not seeing objects, which is a really difficult step. But um, once once you've made that transformation, once you look at your painting subject and don't see a chair, a door, you know, a window, once you're looking at it for its, its pictorial elements um, rather than the description, you know, the descriptive noun, you know, what it is. Um, that's a huge breakthrough. And just, you know, just try to get across to my students that if they can draw from life, if they can translate what they're seeing um, into two dimensions, it's ultimately it's, it means complete freedom to paint whatever they want to paint. Um, so I suppose it's just um, developing the building blocks really and just just trying to get them to see in a more uh in a more painterly way yeah well exciting yeah it is exciting and all of the teaching that i do in is plein air um these days so it's really nice it's really nice we're always outside and the weather in the uk can be you know <laughs> unreliable but we're, we're yeah, oh, it's just changeable, just very changeable. You can have sunshine in the morning, rain in the afternoon, wind the next day. It's just very changeable. So uh, it's lovely. I, I get, uh, we have a two or three day workshop for teaching from lovely places. And um, we're outside. I drag them outside no matter, no matter what. And um, it's, you know, it's the biggest challenge for somebody who's never done it before. It's really quite daunting. But, you know, being together in a group, um, is encouraging, I hope, and and comforting. Yeah. Do you think? Know that other people. Do you think before somebody goes out and and uh, goes outside and and learns to paint outside, they should learn to paint inside, just so they can get comfortable with brushes and materials and so on? Or do you think they should just jump in and do it? Well, yeah, to an extent. I mean, I I think a plein air workshop is really tough, and you've got to have some experience. Uh, I have had. To, I had somebody turn up once who, who bless him, uh, he'd retired, he'd been given the workshop as a gift and he was unwrapping his paints and, uh, you know, as he sat down and he'd never touched a paintbrush since school. And that's really, in, in a plein air workshop, that's not really appropriate because you can't talk somebody through uh, when you, you're, you're really in the deep end, you're taking them outside, they're choosing their own subject. Um, you can't talk somebody through you know which way around to hold the brush and how to how to thin, thin the paint and apply the paint and yeah you do need some experience I you feel. know we, but, we we have a know, lot still, of we, oh go ahead i was just going to say that still life painting you know if people can't get outside but they can practice painting from life can be anything um i would suggest that if they were going on a plein air workshop we we have a, a huge number of people who come to the plein air convention who have never picked up a paintbrush in their life and we have this we have this basics course and we bring all these people in who essentially tell them what to expect what to experience how to deal with the equipment how to deal with the changing light the breezes the you know the bugs whatever (laughs) and then uh and then painting demos and so on and then uh the the instructors then stick with them throughout the week so when they go outside to paint There's somebody that's out there with them saying, okay, now we're going to walk you through this. So it's been amazing to me how many people have been that brave who just show up and, you know, they're not not too worried about making mistakes. They're just out there. And, of course, everybody else that's with them is in somewhat the same boat. So it's kind of nice. It's amazing. It's wonderful if you've got someone there kind of holding your hand as well because um, if I'm 
if I'm teaching a group of 12 or 14 people, you know, I've got 12 or 14 easels to get round, so I I can't particularly stand by your side if you're if you need that extra help, um, you know, on, on an average plan air workshop. So that's that's really nice. Yeah. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure getting to know you and and uh, understanding a little bit about you and what what uh, your career has been like and and painting in the UK. Do you have any final thoughts for everybody listening? Um, ooh. I don't know, really. Just <laughs> final thoughts. Just, just I suppose, just um, maybe just just try to find subjects where you are. I don't think you have to. I don't think you have to travel to Venice or or find a windmill. I think that you you can be inspired um, by anything if you if you open your eyes to choosing subjects based on the pictorial possibilities. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what if you imagine if you went out to paint something and you were looking for shapes, um, particular colours, uh, an abstract arrangement rather than thinking, I oh, like I need to find a church or or a windmill. You know, just just really open your eyes to the possibilities and don't feel that wherever you are that there's nothing worthy because there's no great big landscape vista or anything there's the always worthy subjects to paint so i think i would just encourage people to um open their eyes to the possibilities um and really just you know bloom where you're planted you, you don't have to go far to find a great subject for a painting so we can find you at haidejo.com h-a-i-d-e-e-j-o.com and yeah. you're on instagram at Haiti Joe summers and well thank you so much for being on the plein air podcast we're looking forward to seeing you at the plein air convention thank you i can't wait i can't either it's probably my favorite time <laughs> of the year <laughs> i've never been to colorado either so oh so <laughs> well I, here's what i here's what i'm suggesting to everybody is is build in a couple extra days uh, the last day we're going out to um, the rocky mountain national park to estes park it's uh, it's where mm-hmm. Bierstadt did all those amazing paintings, and and uh, I, you know, I'm kind of even trying to put something together. I don't know if I'll I'll have time to do it, but something to stay there for a few extra days and and uh, just paint the park because it's so spectacular. So uh, get build in yeah. some time if you can. Yeah. I will. I'm going. I'm not coming straight back to the UK. I'm going on to a a new plein air event in New Bern. So that, that's going to be exciting too. Yeah, North Carolina. Yeah. Oh, that'll be nice. Never it's a beautiful, been there either. Beautiful area, a lot of boats. Oh, lovely. Yes. So it'll be it'll be <laughs> the opposite of Colorado. It'll be flat with a lot of water. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. Brilliant. Well, thank you again. There's so much to explore. Oh, there's so much to explore. Are you doing yeah. a lot are you doing a lot of plein air events in the States? Not as many as I'd like to, but, you know, my children are growing up now and I still have a few pets at home, but um, I love, I, I've done a few in Florida and I love an opportunity. I love coming over there um, and working with you guys because I think the American artists are, are great and they're always eager and inspiring and, yeah, I love, I love being over there. So I'd like to do more in the future. Outstanding. Well, thank you again for being on the Plein Air Podcast. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Well, what a brilliant artist. Haiti Joe Summers from England, so friendly. I want to thank her again for doing this podcast. I'm looking forward to meeting her. I've never met her. Well, are you ready for some marketing ideas? This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, Proven Techniques to Turn Your Passion into Profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions, and you can always email them to me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. From Boulder, Colorado, Suzanne Cable asks, how much and how stylized should framing be? I always struggle with framing since I feel like the buyer may want their own style. Well, you know, that's always an option, Suzanne. Buyers sometimes change paintings. Galleries sometimes change paintings. I have a painting hanging in my house that David LaFell painted 
1968. It's a frame that he made himself. It's just beautiful, but it matches the mood of the painting. And he told me about that he couldn't find a frame that matched the mood, so he made one, made what he envisioned. Sometimes a frame complements the painting. Sometimes you want it to blend in. Sometimes you want it to draw you in. It depends on your taste as an artist. But And sometimes the gallery changes the frames for the marketplace. You know, markets are different. Some markets are like gold frame markets. Others are black frame markets. Some are ornate markets. Others are modern, clean lines. It's all dependent on the market where it's going. So it might get changed after the fact. You want to put your best foot forward, though, and try to get it right. Start by matching your taste to the painting. I tell a story about a gallery down south which had an unsold painting in the gallery for a year. The owner had it reframed with a very expensive, like $1,400 frame. No, it was a $2,500 frame. And it sold in the first week for four times the price. Frames matter. Rich people don't respond to cheap frames unless they look really great. All too often, artists buy what they can afford to buy and put them in frames. And I understand that. But frames are like cars. Some people see themselves in a Bentley. Others see themselves in a bucket of bolts the best possible frame you can put on it, you can always up the price to get compensated for the frame. Frames help sell things. Great frames matter. Put great frames on your paintings. Uh, they really will help. And a lot of people don't have the vision to know what kind of frame to put on them, so sometimes they'll just keep them on them. Others will change it, all right? Here's another question from Shanda Sue in Alex Alexandria, Minnesota. Sorry, Shanda Sue. Shonda Sue says, how do you sort through all the art fairs to determine which ones will likely be more successful for you? Well, Shonda Sue, I would apply what I call a market evaluation to the process. Everything you do marketing-wise, you want to attach an outcome and uh, a metric. You know, what are the things that are going to make that outcome come true? What are the, we call them critical drivers. So in a fair... What is the outcome you want from the fair? Let's say you invest $1,000 to be in the fair. What's the minimum outcome you have to get back for that fair to be successful? What's the desired outcome? Let's say your desired outcome is ten grand in sales. What's your desired outcome? How do you get it? What are the critical drivers to that desired outcome? Well, first off, it's having paintings that are going to get you to that price. It's going to have paintings that are, you know, you, you might have a strategy to sell volume. You might have a strategy to sell a lot of $25 paintings to get to $10,000. You might have one big one. Uh, what does it take to pull people into the booth to attract people? What kind of sales uh, does it take? What's the makeup of the attendee? Who's there? What can they afford? What neighborhoods are they coming from? Is work selling at the show? Frankly, I think it's kind of like a magazine, you know, like you want to look for concentrated audiences, like my magazines are concentrated, concentrated audiences of, of buyers. You want, to, you want to get to the buyers. Volume doesn't matter. Somebody can say, hey, I'm going to have a million people through the art show. Well, do you want a million people traipsing through your booth that aren't going to spend anything? You want to attract the money people. You got to figure out a way to attract them, draw them in. Get the right audiences visiting your booth and not wasting your time. And you want people who are going to spend, not sit there and stroke your ego and say, oh, your painting's beautiful. Well, why don't you buy something if it's so beautiful? <laughs> so what matters is that people are buying. Do they have the money to buy? Or are they going to buy potholders or T-shirts? you got to understand that about the fair. And some, some of the best way to do that is go to the fair on your own a year in advance and then consider it for the next year. Talk to the artist, find out what's selling. Find out um, from people who are, um, you know, call in advance people who have been to the show, not from the show organizers, because they're never going to tell you the whole story. They might not know the whole story. Again, know your market. I also think you need a strategy. Everything I do has a strategy attached, or it should anyway, if I'm doing my job. Like if I'm speaking somewhere, I want to go in there knowing the room, knowing the outcome. What am I going to take out of there? You know, am I going to try and promote something? Am I going to try to build an image? Am I going to try to get them to spend some money? Uh, the same thing with a fair. So just know your outcomes. Know your shows. Know your lighting. Know what's going to draw people in. What can you do that nobody else is doing that's going to make you stand out? How do you engage people? 
How do you get them talking? What do you say to them when they say things like, I'll think about it? You need to have a plan. You don't want to go into that unprepared. Need to be ready and loaded for every possible thing. Sit down, write down every possible objection that you're going to get, and then come up with an answer for that objection. If you do, you're golden. You'll outsell every booth there. I hope this helps. This has been the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes. You can learn more at artmarketing.com. Well, thank you for being on the podcast today. Make sure to check out the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. It's figurativeartconvention.com. And make sure to also check out plenairconvention.com and be to one or both. Both would be nice. I'll be at both. And make sure that you're subscribing to Plenair Magazine too. Especially those of you who might be listening from England. Hey, we love having you here. Thank you. Join the uh, plein air movement here. We've got a plein air movement going all around the world, and it's very cool. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life and philosophy, sometimes art, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can find it at coffeewitheric.com, and then you can hit subscribe for free. Always fun doing this. We'll do it again sometime. Like next week, I should be back. I'll probably be jet lagged, but thank you again for listening from Edinburgh. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye. You know, I'm not very good at these Scottish accents, am I? <laughs> this has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.